The following podcast is brought to you by the Jonas Podcasting Network, found exclusively at wrestlingwithjonas.com. Hello and welcome to episode two of my Legends Masterclass series. And uh, for episode two, I've got a fantastic guest. You can see there uh, next to me in the picture, simply the best, Tony St. Clair. So Tony, it's an honor to have you on episode two of Legends Masterclass. How are you doing, first of all? I'm doing okay, thank you. It's also an honor for me to be on your program. And uh, like I told you before, I watched Marcy's uh, program that I, I thought was fantastic. Marcy oh. and I are old school wrestlers, and we stick together through thick and thin. So. Oh, absolutely. And like I said, I had a blast speaking to Marty a few months ago now. Yeah. And uh, episode one, part one and two are out there for people to uh, enjoy. Uh, but today it's all about simply the best Tony St. Clair. And I've been looking forward to this one. And uh, like I say, in my preparation, in my research for this, um, I've learned so much about the great man. Uh, but this is going to be in his own words. And uh, looking at more recent events, Tony, um, we spoke about this a little bit off air, but you, th there's been quite a few reunions, hasn't there, over the last few months? And you've yes. been to one or two of them. Yes, sure. That must be that must be really good to kind of um, see your old pals again, exchange stories, talk about uh, the glory days. Yeah, it is. Uh, I, I tend to go to the north of England ones because obviously getting older. Traveling a long way doesn't suit me. So I go to Leeds, which I think is brilliant. I go to Blackpool, which is also very, very good. Second only behind Leeds. And other than that, uh, I'm, I'm not really interested. Yeah, yeah. And, and to you... I, I, I like... What, what I, what, to interrupt you. What I like about Leeds is that the fans aren't invited, and that's nothing against nothing against the fans. I always had time at the wrestling show to give autographs to anybody that wanted one of me take pictures, anything. But a reunion to me is where old colleagues get together, and that's why I like Leeds and Blackpool. Absolutely, absolutely. And I've seen one or two uh, pictures uh, from recent reunions, and there's been yourself, I think, uh, uh, Johnny Saint has been present at one or two of them. Who else has been present yeah. at some of these reunions then, Tony? Well, like I say, Marty, uh, the M Mitchell families, uh, the Dave Taylor and his brothers, uh Brilliant. the the organizer was also a booth booth fighter darren ward right and uh he's he's a top man and uh, the best wrestling brain for memories and facts that i've ever met that's amazing that really is and uh, do you keep up with much pro wrestling nowadays. Now, I, I did see you because uh, I was part of the team at uh, World Pro Wrestling, the show they did in uh, Cheltenham in February. So I was there and I, I did see you um, and you did your speech during the intermission. But besides that, do you get out and about? Do you see much wrestling? Do you still enjoy watching it as a fan? Um, I, I went to one of All Stars promotions, which lies in the bottom of my heart. I work yeah. for All Star for years and they have old school wrestling that's right in my heart so i i would go regularly to them without doubt there's not absolutely much there's not much else for me to 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 look at in england i i won't go to american 
American shows, or I, I have done in the past, but yeah. I don't think I would go to today. I'm, I'm yeah. not that interested in American wrestling. And uh, I, I like to watch Japanese. I, I follow if I can, uh, because I, I spent almost two years of my life in Japan with various tours. And uh, I have very, very good contacts to uh, a number of Japanese wrestlers from my era. So uh, the, the last tour I was on in Japan, I think was 2002. It was uh, uh, a Legends tour of Japan. I was the only English man on it. And I was in the company of Dory, Terry Funk, Brian Blair, uh, and, and, and. And I, I was so proud to be on that tour as the only Englishman. It meant a lot to me. Thanks oh, to, so thanks to uh, Fujinami-san and Nishimura-san for arranging it for me. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, um, I was also I was also there on the thirtieth anniversary of New Japan's uh, with uh, Antonio Inoki. I was the only foreigner invited to that evening. Oh, tremendous, tremendous! And let's say not yeah. are you not only are you beloved over here in the UK. Um, and, and of course, Japan and Germany, um, pretty much every country you travel to, uh, you fell into the hearts of that nation. But um, I, I want to take you all the way back, Tony, if we can, and um, talk about how it all began for you, because I understand that you were uh, you were born into pro wrestling pretty much because your father was a tremendous pro wrestler in his own right, um, starting in, in about 1922 through to the 50s. So you were born into right. a wrestling. You were born into a wrestling family, weren't you? Yeah, Roy, my brother, uh, who's still alive. Uh, he was a British champion, I think, middleweight or light heavyweight, but only short spells. Uh, he was actually a better wrestler than I was, but he he didn't have the dedication or not the dedication. He was happy just being what he was, a wrestler. He didn't he didn't he didn't have the killer instinct that I had. And that was the only difference between us. He he trained me uh, to be a wrestler. I wanted to be a footballer at first. I was really? two year, wow. two seasons, two seasons at Manchester United in a youth team. And uh, it didn't work out for me. They, they released me, and I turned to wrestling. Yeah, yeah. And was you influenced not only by your brother, but by your father? I think your father was uh, Francis Gregory, and he kind yeah. of played in many sports. He was a boxer, he uh, played rugby, and he was a pro wrestler. Um, and That's I'm right. guessing that he, he was a big influence over you when you were growing up also, oh, I'm assuming. Tremendous, tremendous. Although when when I wanted to be a footballer, he didn't try and talk me out of it. And when I quit the football, and I went to him and I asked him, uh, "Dad, very laid back, Dad, uh, I've decided I do want to be a wrestler. Have you got the time? Have you got the time to uh, maybe?" Uh, and, uh, and he was already. Uh, doing Sunday wrestling at uh, Wrighton Stadium in Bolton for Arthur Wright's promotion. So I said, yeah, okay, come along. So he, he helped my training as well, although he was oh, 58, 60 at that time. He was run, running a pub and training wrestlers. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned your brother there, Roy. Um, and it was Roy and uh, Terry Downs, wasn't it, that uh, put you through your paces when they were training you? There was a number. 
Uh, Pete Roberts, who also trained with, with my father, used to come and stay with us every Saturday and Sunday. So he helped a lot. Colin Joynson came and helped me as well. Uh, so it was, it was a, the, the Manchester, Salford, Oldham yeah. wrestlers that came and helped me when they could. Yeah. And um, please correct me on my dates here, but I think you started as a pro yourself around 1966 and you teamed with your brother for a number of years, didn't you? You were the Magnificent Saints, um, Roy and uh, Tony St. Uh, St. Clair. Tell us about those days being a tag team partner with your brother. Well, like I said, Roy was the better wrestler of the two of us. Um, we, we just fitted in perfectly. Uh, and the the heel tag teams like the Black Diamonds and Adrian and Bobby Barnes, they loved it because they used to kick the shit out of me and Roy would, Roy would come in and do the cavalry. And it, it was perfect. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you teamed with uh, Roy for many years, didn't you, for about nine or ten years until you went singles or, or solo performer by yourself. Um, what, what was the decision behind going solo? Um, did Roy retire or what was the, the reasoning behind that? No, no, no. no. We, when we started, I, I did, from, from the very, very beginning, I did tag matches and singles. Uh, it was a mixture. Yeah. Uh, I, I, di I didn't. I didn't start and just do tag matches. I mean, we we were wrestling, Roy and I, minimum twenty eight times a month. Wow. Minimum. So we got a couple of tag matches, a couple of singles, a couple of tag matches, and uh, then I, I started going to London. Mick McManus decided I was his favourite, so I was on against Mick and Steve Logan with Roy, or Mick, then Mick decided he wanted singles against me, so I was lucky, in the right place at the right time. Yeah, yeah, you, of you often hear this, but like I say, you obviously had the, the skills and the desire as well to do really, really well. Um, in the 70s and the 80s, there were some key wrestling groups in the UK, wasn't there? There was Dale Martin Promotions, Joint Promotions, All Star. Yes. Who did you start with? Um, did you start with, with the Joint Promotions you kind of spent a fair bit of your time with in the early years? Yeah, well, Joint Promotions was a mixture of seven different promoters. There was... Dale Martins in London, Rail, Rail Wisco and Green in Leeds, uh, Arthur Wright in Manchester, uh, who else was there? Norman Morell, also in Yorkshire, uh, George Kidd in Scotland, Max Crabtree, who, who did. Max took a like to me straight away the first time I ever wrestled for him. And he was in charge of total joint promotions when I became British heavyweight champion. Max said he, he wanted me to be the new champion. So he had a, a big part in my, my early career as well. I, I was going to ask, I mean, you mentioned about joint promotions being made up of a... Uh you know, a, a, a bunch of groups, a bunch of promotions all under one uh, yeah. roof. But was there much rivalry between any of the promotions in the 70s and the 80s? Um, you, you kind of get the impression that if you worked for one group, you would be frowned upon if you worked for another, if you understand my meaning. You know, the, there was only two poss possibilities, either joint promotions uh, or... Opposition, as, as joint wrestlers used to call it, the opposition. Right. And that and that was Orig Williams, uh, Brian Dixon, 
uh, uh, George Kidd, but he worked alone, but in in with joint promotions. It was a very complicated affair. Uh, but like I said, either joint promotions or opposition. And then right. joint promotions would meet every month and decide which wrestlers. I mean, there, there were maybe three or 400 full-time wrestlers when I started, working every day of the week. So joint promotions would meet, and Dale Martin usually had the, the biggest pick because they had the most shows. And, and when I say most shows, they had, in summer, with all the uh, tourist resorts, they had 70 or 80 shows a month. Wow. A month. That's incredible. Yeah. I, yeah. I once got, you used to get a, a date sheet of joint promotions saying what days you were booked and which promoter you were working for. And I had one month that had 30 days in it, and I had 31 matches in that month. And Adrian Street beat me. He had 32. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But it was yeah. a, the best learning you could get. I mean, absolutely. Practice, yeah. practice makes perfect in wrestling. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've spoke to so many wrestlers on my uh, Wrestling With Johnners podcast that um, swear that the, the holiday camp circuit is the best proving ground for any up and coming oh. wrestler. If you want to cut your teeth and if you want to get to that next level, you know, by wrestling, I don't know, 14, 15 times in a week on the holiday camp, exactly. that's, the, that's the only yep. way to do it. Exactly. And all, all the best did it. Absolutely. And they still do um, when you talk about the likes of Joel Redmond and, uh, you know, people that have, have been there, been to the, uh, the big time and still do the holiday camps nowadays. And they're the, the, the best, the unsung heroes of the British circuit, in my opinion. But um, tell us a bit yeah. about tell us a bit about the crowds back then in the 70s and the 80s, because whenever I've seen footage of UK shows, British wrestling shows from that era, it's all the houses are packed. The crowd yes. are really, really into the action. Um, and they, they, yes. they, they, they really kind of believe, you know, the, 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 the good guys, the, you know, the superheroes, and you've got the villains, the heels, uh, with the old ladies and the walking sticks and the handbags chasing the heels around the ring. You see kind of tremendous footage like that. But the houses in the 70s and the 80s were absolutely packed. And um, like I say, they were a lot more animated than what you might find in more modern times. Yeah, of course. The, the wrestlers didn't talk to the press or to, didn't talk bad about wrestling. Now everybody knows it's, it's not a fake. It's a pro professional sport that is hard, but there is a winner decided elsewhere than in the ring. Yeah. That, that is what I will say. But all the good ones, all the good ones got seriously in, injured a couple of times a month and didn't cry about it either. So, yes, it is. One, one thing I, I want to tell you, you, you mentioned superstars, uh, heels, baby faces, one group that nobody ever remembers is the Carpenters. Good point. I bet you've never, you've never heard that, have you? I have once or twice, but um, it's not something you hear every day, Tony. No, it's not very common. No. The, the Carpenters were what made me and people like me into stars. They, they weren't jobbers. Carpenters were experienced people that could go in the ring and make somebody look good. He was the pride of the promoters because 
they didn't get as much as top of the mill, mill men, but you could rely on them to make a bad wrestler look good. And they never get a mention. I, I thank all of them. People like Colin Joyce. He wasn't a superstar, but one of the biggest influences in my career without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to talk about some of your championships that you won now over here in, in Britain, because uh, you won your yeah. first British heavyweight title in 1977, didn't you? Um, and uh, yes. you, I think you lost it to Giant Haystacks, regained it a short while later. Um, and then you, you, in 1978, you was a two-time British heavyweight champion. And what a lot of people might not know, um, uh, sorry, 1979, you won your second title, but you you kept the title for nearly nine years, Tony, 3,270 yeah. days. That's a title reign that you don't see nowadays. Um, but even yeah. back then, that must have been uh, considered um, a, 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 a well-deserved but very long title reign. Um, give us your thoughts on being a British champion. I think you were a British champion four times, weren't you? Um, but yes. uh, that one that one in particular stands out purely because of the, the length, nearly nine years for your second reign, Tony. That's right, yeah. Uh, I, I won it, like you say, in 1977 in my hometown, hometown Manchester, Bellevue. Yep. Uh, Max... Crabtree was the promoter, just made joint promotions chief, and he wanted me to be champion. What they forgot, or maybe they forgot, maybe they didn't, to tell the reigning champion, who was Gwyn Davis, that he had to lose. And so the match was billed out of the blue. No build-up. No thoughts of a return. It was just British heavyweight champion Gwyn Davis defends against Tony Sinclair in Bellevue. And Gwyn came in, lovely man, Gwyn, Gwyn, lovely man. Came into the dressing room and he says, Tony, they just, Max has just given me the orders. You're to win. Seventh round, he says, and I've told him no. So I want to tell you that as well. And he said, I not told him no, I won't do it. I told him no, I won't do it tonight because it's our first match and I don't want to give in without a build up to it. Yeah. And I agreed with him fully. So we, we went in. The end end was uh, I can't explain it. It wasn't he he won, but in a dis disputable way. Yeah. And I challenged him for a rematch, which he agreed to. Obviously, came back a month later and dropped the belt which I appreciated him for years because he told me to my face. And that's how we did business back then. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, like I say, that, that epic championship reign of nine years, you won it back in 1979, beating Haystacks, didn't you? Um, a very memorable yes. reign. Um, and uh, like I say, I don't think anybody's ever beaten that in terms of the length of rain uh, since Tony? No, I don't, I don't think they have. Uh, uh, very, before, very memorable before, rain. Before mm -hmm. the past champions reigned years and years and years, but it, it changed since, since then. And it's not to do with who's the best is that wins, you know. I mean, Bert Azarati was champion for years because he, he really was the best. Uh, but that's all changed now. 
what do you remember about the uh, uh, the Mount Evans Rules World Championship? Because you you was uh, uh, that world champion as well between 1982 and 1984, weren't you? And you had several memorable uh, matches against Mighty John Quinn, Wayne Bridges. They seem to be, besides yourself, the the two main challengers to your title uh, when you were that uh, when you were the world champion uh, of uh, the, the Mount Evans Rules. What do you remember about that little run between 82 and 84? The, the World Championship yeah. uh, belt that I, I won from John Quinn. That's right. Uh, at uh, Hanley. And, uh, yeah, John had less, left Max Trabtree over money, which I heard about. And I was having trouble with the, the Crabtree family, not with Max, uh, because I asked Max if I could sell pictures at the shows right? because, because I wasn't earning enough money as champion. And he said, yes, do it. So when I went to Bellevue, started selling them, Brian Crabtree took offence. You can't do that. You're killing daddy's sales. I said, what a load of cobblers. Daddy's sales won't be affected by me at all. He sells many, many more than I do and will also always sell more than, than I will. But... I went to Max and said, Max, I've had trouble with Brian. Max said, oh, kid, it's my family. What can I do? I said, give me double the money. <laughs> and he said, no. So like I say, I, I heard John Quinn had also got fed up with his money. He just pulled, I don't know, 14, 15,000 people in Wembley Arena against Daddy. Yeah. Got, got badly injured as well. Got a measly payout. So he he switched, switched to Brian Dixon and Oreg Williams and anybody else, the opposition promoters. So I immediately phoned Oreg Williams, who I knew from meeting he was an ex-footballer. I was an ex-footballer. And said, uh, Oreg, I've heard you've got John Quinn. Who's, who's told you that? It's not out yet. It's not out yet. I said, John told me. So uh, I said, what would you pay me? He said, we don't need you. Do, you, do we? So I said, well, who else have you got to... Put on with Quinn, Dave Taylor, uh, so he was thinking. So I said, Dave is a, a great contender, great contender, contender with John Quinn. I said, but who have you got? Who has got British television? Matches against John Quinn that ended unsatisfactorily. Said me, I'm the only one. So it's immediately a draw for you. How much you want? I said, double what Max has offered me. Oh, bloody hell, we can't. I said, <laughs> double, what, double what Max has offered me. So because I left because of that. Yeah. I said, yeah. Give, give me 24 hours, I'll, I'll call Dixon. And 24 hours later, Ori phoned me up and said, OK. So I got double what I was earning off Max, and John Quinn got double what I was asking for as well. So that, was the, that was the appeal of the opposition to joint promotions. Joint promotions... You could work every day. So it's great for beginners. But for money, 
opposition were much better. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I want to talk about Germany now, if we can, Tony. Um, yeah. Now, you, you started working in Germany in 1974. And for the first 10 years or so, you worked for um, a number of smaller promotions around Germany. Um, but in 1984, you started working for Catch Wrestling Association and Otto Vance, didn't you? What what was the circumstances that led to you kind of signing with Otto and working with Catch Wrestling? Um, and because uh, that was the company that you really made your name for in Germany, wasn't it? Yeah, I don't know about the dates. The first time I went to Germany was to go to Hanover uh, for a month. Roy and a lot, lot of English wrestlers had, had started going over a couple of years before me. Uh, I, th I think it was it, it was before I got the British Heavyweight Championship, for sure. Uh, so I went for a month to Hanover, and the promoter was arrogant didn't hold his word to me because I was only going for a month. The tournament was two months. So uh, I had problems with him about the money. I, was, I wasn't British champion at that time. That's why I know it was earlier. Yeah. Uh, in, fact, in fact, I was quite new, quite new in the business. And Roy and Colin Joyce and Steve Haggerty were regulars in Hanover. Ran for, I think, two months every night in the same tent. So I went to, the, I, first of all, I got paid out the first night by the matchmaker, Peter Williams, uh, who became my mentor in Germany. I went to him and said, I've got paid tonight and it's not what I was expecting. So took me into the promoter. Promoter said, no, uh, I think 10 marks less than the others were getting. If you don't like it, you can go home. So I said, out of principle, okay. Then I'll go home, make my travel arrangements, pay for it, and I'll go. No, no. If you're going home, you, you're sacked. You've got to go today without travel expenses. So Peter Williams, the matchmaker, pulled me on one side and he said, just do the month out, go home, and... In a couple of years, when this promoter has gone, I will be in charge and I'll come back to you in England to book you for Germany, which he did uh, about five, six years later and made me a lot of money in Germany. In between that time, I worked for Nico Selenkovic, uh, who was a, one of the best promoters I've ever worked for and in Bremen and small few small towns but it, Bremen was his six weeks just before Christmas and I started going to him every year that is where I met Otto Vance who worked for Nico as well and that's where he wanted me to go to CWA in Graz and uh, Vienna. And then it became Linz. It was like eight or nine months of the year. But that, that was when CWA formed. But before that, it was Nico Selenkovic, who was a fantastic man, promoter, and human being. And I'm still in contact with his son. And we, we get together and meet whenever we can. And he was a, the best promoter. But I, I got for Otto Vance, yes. And Graz. And Graz was a, a 
beautiful place to, to work, live. I actually thought one time, a long, long, long time ago, when I retire, I'm going to live in Graz. But obviously that, that changes when life goes on. Of I course. mean, at one, <laughs> one, one point, just before I, I married my third wife, who sadly died two years ago, but my the, the love of my life, and uh, she was a German wrestling fan. And I wanted, that's how I, I settled in Germany. I was spending eight months of the year there regardless. So that, that's why I settled there, uh, because of the love that I met with her. At one, one point, Japan, New Japan, also had a place for me to re retire to teach their young wrestlers. Uh, which I I was thinking about, but like I say, I met Christiana and life changes, you know. So yeah. I I got out. I, I didn't end up going to J Japan to live, which is probably the best. But yeah, I, I yeah. love I love I love Japan. The people, the wrestlers, the art that they teach wrestling. It's fantastic. Absolutely. And Absolutely. Uh, the the last time I I went there for my seventieth birthday, uh, arranged by Osamu Nishimura, uh, my best Japanese friend, great wrestler, trained under Dory Funk. He's still wrestling, and uh, my seventieth birthday, he organised my trip to Japan uh, and one of his sponsors paid for my birthday with all the New Japan pro wrestlers that I knew that I booked into Germany all came to attend my 70th birthday. It cost the, the, uh, the sponsor, I think, over $10,000 the night. Fantastic. And for, wow. that, for that, I'm very, very grateful. And I, I will definitely, definitely go back to Japan again one day just for a visit again. Absolutely. But, uh, I, I so, actually go on. actually did over the same amount of years, eight, nine, ten years, Japan regularly. Uh, two or three times a year. I, I think I had over 25 tours of Japan for between four and six weeks a tour and uh, spent two years of my life in Japan. Absolutely. And uh, Nishimura arranged for me when I retired to get on a Legends tour. And I went on that tour, like I say, with the Funk Brothers, Steve Kern, who was the original Doint, and uh, a, a couple more. We had a, a fantastic time, and uh, I, I love Japan, love it to death. Absolutely. I want to speak to you more about Japan in a moment, but to just just stick yeah. in with Germany for a bit. I want, I want to talk to you about Fit Finley uh, because I think yes. Fit Finley will go down as probably one of, if not the greatest rival, uh, the the greatest dance partner you've ever had in the ring, won't you, Tony? And I think you wrestled yes. uh, with uh, with Fit in Germany for um, CWA many many times. I think well over a hundred times in yes. a variety of matches. And I think that the, yes. the German wrestling fans will regard your history with Fit Finley as probably one of the, the greatest feuds that they've ever seen in CWA history. And like I say, your matches with Fit Finley will, will go down in German wrestling history for the matches that you've had 
give us your thoughts on your your rivalry with Fit Finley and and Fit Finley as a as a person in your heart. First of all, as a person, he's right through my heart. I, I love the guy so much. I can't tell you. Uh, the the feud that we had that lasted, and do you know why it lasted? Because please tell me. Because we beat the shit out of each other every match. We did the first cage match in Germany on a, I think, Wednesday night, the slowest night of the week, and sold it out and turned 500 people away. Wow. I think that, I think that, was it a tent? I think the tent pulled two and a half thousand. And, uh, the, the the cage matches and the the, the gimmick matches uh, I'll call them went down in history and so when I decided to retire my my wife by the way used to hate Finley because I, I never told her that what was going on at all when when we when we accidentally met by chance in Hanover or Bremen in a, a pub or restaurant after the shows, we carried it on. I've, <laughs> I've, fought, fought, with, I've fought with Finley in small bars in Bremen, in Hanover, and we, we lived the life. And it showed by the, the houses that we pulled. Yeah. So when I decided to retire, uh, first of all, the first person I asked was John Layfield because Fit was injured. He had a, a serious accident on his foot. They thought he was going to lose his foot at one point going through a, a table. And uh, so he, my first choice, couldn't come. John Layfield, who was one of my pupils in Bremen. I, I, I don't like to train people for wrestling that start out. I like to get professional wrestlers and extend what they've done and make their show better, like John Layfield, uh, Kane from America, WWE, yeah. I helped, helped him. Uh, Ice Train from WCW. I remember him. Helped him. Again. Yeah. Uh, Eric Watts, the son of yeah. Billy Watts, of helped course. him. That was my type of people. The people that were professional wrestlers but just needed the polish on top. So, Absolutely. so we 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 got Finley to eventually he got a, a boot made that could support his ripped knee, and he came, and uh, he brought with him Dave Spencer, who was a ring announcer in the states. Penzer, Dave Penzer. Yeah, Dave Penzer. Yeah, yeah. He was with Fit. I I went to pick Fit up at a uh, American show in uh, near Dortmund. He was fr Friday night there and Saturday by me. And when I picked him up, he said, "Dave Penzer wants to come with us and was offered to MC your last match with me." I said. What's he want? I said, yeah. They said he didn't want anything. He just want a hotel room, meal, and respect. I said, great. He's my man. Sounds sounds a good price. So the end of the the show, who I, the show I was promoting, and I lost in the fifteenth round to Finley. 
And at the after, after show party, everybody was getting drunk and Penza came and sat to me, had a drink together, and he said, there's one question I've, I've got to ask you. Really got to ask you this question. I thought he was going to ask me for money. Ben <laughs> Lee told me. So he said, you promoted this show. You've had so much heat with Finley over the years. You proposed to your, your wife from the ring after the show, who was just your girlfriend, but you proposed to her. Why on earth did you lose your last fight? I said, in all honesty, I said, Dave, I said, if I'd have won the fight, everybody would have gone out clapping and cheering, and tomorrow morning they'd have all forgotten about it. I, said, I wanted the people to go out crying, which they did, because when something upsets you that much, you never forget it. And he yeah. said, fair play. But that, that was the reason I, I did it because I wanted the people to never forget it. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. And at the end, I said, I lost my first match, which I did, Johnny Eagles in Colm, England. Lost my first match, lost my last match, but in between, I won a hell of a lot. You said And did. I did. <laughs> 